Uh, thank you very much for coming to this tonight. I'm with the North Park Historical Society, and Sharon is with the Chicago Public Library, and we partnered in order to be able to bring this, this wonderful presentation to our neighborhood, because I don't know if all of you live here or not, but there are serious houses in Norwood Park. And, and if you come over to Norwood Park um, to the Historical Society at 5624 North Newark, we have a film on Saturdays where a man who lives in one of the houses takes you on a tour of his house. And it's really a remarkable, just to think about that it all got delivered to your house or your lot, it all got delivered, and then it had little numbers on it later on. In the beginning, it didn't, I guess, but I'm not going to spoil your story. So um, we're 50 years old in this community. This is our 50th anniversary. So we're really grateful that everybody comes out for our meetings. You can become a member. Membership is $25 a year. And if you become a member tonight, you're good until December 31st, 2024. So I encourage everyone to become a member. We don't have any employees. Everything that goes on is done by this wonderful team of volunteer people. A board is all volunteer. All the people who help out, the docents are volunteers. So if you have any interest at all in the history, some of it history of Chicago, but some of it the history of Norwood Park, come over to the museum on Saturdays from 12 to four and take a tour and it will just be phenomenal. John is one of our docents and he gives. So again, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to introduce our speaker and she's going to tell you about herself. So Dr. Hunter, and she's one of the foremost experts on Sears Houses. So again, thank you all for coming. You've got it. Thank you. That Hello, it's so good to be in Norwood Park. I remember the first time I ever drove through the area. And of course, I was looking for mail order houses because, you know, that's what I do. <laughs> and I thought, what a lovely neighborhood. I like the way the streets were laid out. I, um, I just thought, what a pleasant place to live. And so I'm very glad to be here again. So um, I first got interested in mail order houses when I moved to Elgin, Illinois in uh, 1997. Since I've been a researcher since I was 11 years old, the first thing I did on moving to Elgin was buy, I bought an arts and crafts bungalow, a 1923 bungalow. I went to the local library. Libraries are the best places. You can never go wrong in the library. And I wanted to research bungalows. And so I went to the shelf and got all the bungalow books. But thanks to the Dewey Decimal System, this book was on the shelf right next to the bungalow books. And I said, houses by mail, what a crazy idea. I wonder what it's about. And I go, ha, huh, these are really nice. Oh, look at this. Oh, wow, I got to get this book, I think. But I checked it out because it was out of print. And I um, kept reading it and looking at it. This is a compilation of most of the Sears modern homes from the catalogs 1908 to 1940. Um, some five years are missing, so all the models are not in here. But this is the first book that was written where anybody made an effort to figure out the history of Sears mail order houses. I been looking on the internet recently and I'd say 90% of the stuff on the internet about Sears houses is inaccurate. This book is very well researched and so if you want to know what was known about Sears houses in 1986, this is a very good place to start. So I ordered the book and I renewed it three times before my copy came in the mail and my primary exercise in winter was walking. And it was February 9th, 1997, and the sun was shining and the sky was blue and it was like 10 degrees on it. I said, I don't want to go for my walk. <laughs> and then I said, ha ha, you know what? I wonder 
I wonder if I could take this book and walk through my neighborhood and find some of these. <laughs> and uh, this house on the back cover is the very first Sears house I ever identified. <laughs> and so I took the book and I went on my walk and I kept walking through Elgin's neighborhoods and I compiled a list of 70 houses that looked like the pictures in the book. And I went to the Heritage Commission and I gave them the list and I said, does anyone here know anything about this? And they all shook their heads and said, no, but we'd like to. Can we hire you to do a survey? Now, I'm not a very modest person. I probably should have said, oh, no, no, come on. You don't want to hire me. I really, I don't know anything about this. I didn't say that. I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the first of many surveys. Elgin was my proving grounds where I figured out a methodology for what I was trying to do. And um, I go all over the country. Um, most of the mail order house companies didn't keep their sales records. And so we're back to visually matching things to the catalog and then trying to prove if they really are or not. Um, and uh, there's a few of us who are crazy enough. We like to spend our holidays going to a place we've never been. We say, let's meet in Akron, Ohio. And we book into a motel and at the crack of dawn, we hit the road and we go up and down every street. We have the driver, the navigator, and two photographers in the back. <laughs> anyway, we're a little crazy, but that's what we like to do. So um, let's get started with this thing here. Do you want to do a little quiz? Okay, I'm going to put pictures up of houses and I want you to holler out yes or no if you think it's a mail order house, okay? There's house number one. No. House number two. Yes. House number three. Yes. House number four. Yes. Number five. Yes. Number six. Yes. Number seven. Okay, so I can tell from your answers that this is not an easy topic. <laughs> this is not an easy topic. Um, before we get into the formal presentation, let's take a look. The first house is from the Aladdin Company out of Bay City, Michigan, the Lindbergh model. Um, there's the house in the catalog and there's the house in Ohio. This was the Ward's farmland, the very early Montgomery Ward's model that was popular in rural areas. This is not a mail order house. It's a prefabricated all steel home from the Lestron Company out of Ohio. This is the Sears Mitchell model. This is... Um, a house from Sears that's a sectional home. It was constructed at the factory in four foot wide sections and then nailed together on the building site. This is the Aladdin Alamo. Uh, Sears went out of the mail order house business in 1940, but Aladdin company was still in business up to 1982. So of course there are ranch houses that are mail order. Uh, this is a Queen Anne style house from 1892, and since mail order houses started in 1906, we can handily toss out anything earlier. So the first thing I had to do was decide what is my topic of study. Uh, so um, this is my my definition of a mail order house. It's a house that was marketed through a mail order catalog and the company provided the buyer with plans and material, okay? The materials could be bulk or pre-cut. Um, it was shipped by train or barge to the uh, nearest train station and then the buyer had to get it from the 
train siding to the building site. It was copied from whatever style was popular that year. That is why there's so much confusion when we look at a house and we go, well, is it a mail order house? So isn't it a mail order house? Well, it's a Cape Cod style. Well, mail order houses, some of them were Cape Cod style. <laughs> so um, they didn't say someday Rebecca Hunter is going to look for these houses and we should make them unique. <laughs> they didn't say that. They went to the board and said, what are they buying this year? And then they said to the architects, make some. <laughs> um, it was um, a single supplier and using mass production, which is why it was cheaper to build a mail order house than to do it the regular way. So sometimes people say to me, in my town, there's 20 houses that are identical and they're all in a row. Surely those are mail order houses. And I say that anything is possible, but I would make a guess that it's a local builder who put up a bunch of the same house in a row. But when I get really excited, I see the same house in Illinois, Kentucky, New York State, and then I look in the Aladdin catalog and there it is. And I say, yes, 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 that must be a mail order house. <laughs> so um, when I see the same house all over the country, that's when I start getting pretty excited about it. So who bought them? The houses were, um, the advertising was aimed at the buyer of modest means. So the middle class. And because of the money savings, uh, it, I think it was possible this way for a lot of families to buy their her first home sooner than they would have been able to. Of course, before 1920, a lot of the buyers were in rural areas because the population of the country was primarily rural up until 1920. After World War II, it shifted to primarily urban. Um, the commuter suburbs that grew up in the 20s were the location probably of most of our mail order houses from 1920 on. And um, the Chicago area is ringed with suburbs that have many mail order houses. The city itself has very few for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, most of the houses in the, what were the city limits at time, they were older than that, okay. And um, the second reason is that Chicago had very strong carpenters union and they did not want anybody to put up their own house. And so they really made efforts to stomp out the mail order houses within the city limits. But when the commuter suburbs grew up, everybody was um, putting up their mail order house there. How were they built? I think most people hired a local contractor. My first study in Elgin, Illinois, one thing I researched was the occupation of the original owners. And I found that 25% of those worked in the building trades. And so I said, okay, well, 25% of these people certainly had the skills to put together a house. Whether they did or not, I have little evidence, but um, my guess is most people hired a contractor. If you didn't know a contractor, the mail order house company would be glad to help you find someone local. Um, and of course, then you could do it yourself. You need to be able to read blueprints and follow directions and have basic carpentry skills. I was convinced that the only company that ever did mail order houses was Sears Roebuck from Chicago, Illinois, until a man in Peoria sent me this picture and he said, this is my parents' Sears house in Peoria. And I went through all my catalogs and I'm going, I can't find any model that looks anything at all like that. And I was mystified, but I wrote the man a nice letter and I said, thank you for all the pictures and thank you for the history of your parents' house. That's very interesting. <laughs> and three years later, three years after that, I got my hands on a Montgomery Ward mail order catalog. <laughs> <laughs> and there was the house. And I went, oh, I can't just 
be the Sears lady. <laughs> because it's like Kleenex. Every mail order house is a Sears house. Even if it came from Bay City, Michigan, from the Aladdin Company or Pacific Homes in California or Gordon Van Tyne and Devon, they're all Sears homes. Okay, so that, that fact is probably what kept me doing this for so many years. Sears sold about 400 different models and that's a very manageable chunk. And I probably would have got bored if that's all I had to work with. But now I'm tracking about 1,600 different models from nine companies. So this keeps my interest nicely. The um, mail order homes, these are producers that sold over a big geographical area. There were some companies that had small local markets and I decided to just go for the big ones. Um, Aladdin started the whole thing in 1906 in Bay City, Michigan. And uh, Pacific Homes jumped on the bandwagon in 1908 in Los Angeles. Sears jumped on the bandwagon in 1908. And Harris Brothers also in 1908. Gordon Van Tyne in 1909. And Montgomery Ward, 1909. Lewis Company, Bay City, Michigan, 1913, and then Sterling Company, 1915, and then McClure, 1922. <laughs> you can see there's kind of a Bay City, Michigan theme here. And if anyone tells you that Illinois has more mail order houses than anybody, they're lying. Okay, <laughs> They're all up there in Michigan. There, there's one town in Michigan that has a thousand mail order houses from Sterling Company. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Elgin, Illinois has 311 mail order houses from all the companies combined. Okay, so you're getting the idea. Okay, you can't just be the Sears lady. These are some smaller producers that just sold to a local market. And if any of these come to my notice, I pay attention to them. The system built is Frank Lloyd Wright's version of pre-cut housing. Uh, he designed 24 pre-cut models. Only 12 were ever put into production and very few were actually built. So um, if, anyone's, uh, if, any, if anyone says, Frank Lloyd Wright never did that, you say, yeah, he did, system built homes. Yeah. Aladdin Company started out with uh, two guys. One was uh, advertiser and one was a marketer and um, a lawyer. And they said, you know what? There's a lot of boats up here in Bay City. I wonder if we could make a pre-cut boathouse. I wonder if anybody would buy it. And so they got an architect and they designed a couple of pre-cut boathouses. All the boards are cut at the factory and numbered and um, they sold like hotcakes. And so then the Sovereign Brothers said, hey, let's, uh, let's make a couple houses. And so they made a couple houses and those sold like hotcakes. And then they started publishing catalogs with mail order houses. And um, initially Aladdin didn't own production facilities. They subcontracted it. Of all the mail order companies, they sold the most. And of all the mail order companies, they are the only ones that saved any sales records. And so um, there's a university library in Michigan that has the Aladdin sales records, uh, which is very helpful in trying to track these down. They also opened a plant in Oregon so they could cover the West Coast market. And they were in the business longer than anyone. Pacific Homes was the major West Coast supplier. And most of the designs are California bungalows, which is my personal favorite style on earth. So I like them. Um, and their competitors were Gordon Van Tyne and Aladdin Company who had production facilities on the West Coast as well. Sears was the most publicized supplier, which is why all mail order houses are from Sears. And they began in, 1886 as a, a supplier of watches because Mr. Sears got a deal. He worked for the railroad. He got a deal on a lost freight shipment of watches and he got it for hardly anything. And so he printed up a little catalog and started selling watches. 
And uh, that went very well. So we ordered more watches and he sold those and he added some jewelry to the line. And then one day he said to himself, you know what, people are buying these watches, but eventually they're going to send them back because they need maintenance. I don't know anything about it. And so he put out an ad that he would like to hire a watchmaker. And Mr. Roebuck, a watchmaker from Indiana, replied to the ad. And Sears and Roebuck teamed up, and you know where it went from there. So uh, Sears was a major provider of mortgage financing, which uh, most of the mail order companies didn't touch that. Um, so Gordon Van Tyne began as a lumber mill, and then they thought, hey, we have lumber, we could sell houses. They're right on the Mississippi River, so they could ship by boat or by train, a little extra flexibility. They are the source of the houses that Ward sold from 1918 to 31, because Ward's again didn't own production facilities. They opened a mill in Washington State so they could cover the West Coast market. Harris Brothers, I uh, have a book all ready to publish about Harris Brothers because very little is known um, none of the catalogs have been reprinted and are available for sale. Um, but they started in 1892 in Chicago. They called themselves Chicago House Wrecking Company, and they did architectural salvage, like big time, like world's fairs and things like that. And um, they then they decided to get into the mail order house market. And in 1913, somebody at the board meeting probably said, you know, we'd probably sell more homes if we changed the name of our company. <laughs> and so they changed it from Chicago House Wrecking Company to Harris Brothers. And um, they got out of the mail order house business in the early 1930s, moved up to Wisconsin and continued to produce doors and windows till 1960. Montgomery Ward. Did you know that the Ward's catalog is older than the Sears catalog? Sure. Yep, yep, yep. And they subcontracted their design and production. And they did ready cut homes from 1917-31. I remember when I saw this in the catalog. I said, that is such a conglomeration of architectural style. Who would buy that? I said, I have seen them everywhere. I have seen them everywhere. People would buy it. Um, Lewis Liberty, they were the lumber mill that the Sovereign Brothers went to to provide the materials for the Aladdin Company homes. And everything was going well, but then they, um, they went to the company, they went to Lewis and said, um, we got so many orders and we're expanding our business and we want you to expand your factory so you can make our stuff faster. And Lewis Company said, no way, no way. We're not doing that for you. And so the Sovereign Brothers got mad and took their business elsewhere. And Lewis Company sat there for a few minutes and said, well, uh, you know, uh, we already know how to do this. Let's print our own catalog. <laughs> so they did. Sterling Company, two years after uh, Lewis Company, right? Same thing happened. Sovereign Brothers went to them. They made the Aladdin Company homes. They got in a little dispute with the Sovereign Brothers and the, the Sovereign Brothers took their business elsewhere. <laughs> uh, Sterling Company said, well, huh, you know what? Uh, we know how to do this. Let's print our own catalog. So we have three companies going out of Bay City, Michigan. Um, And we'll look at some early examples here. This is one of a really rare find of an old mail order house. Anybody been to Flora, Illinois lately? Anybody heard of Flora, oh. Illinois? <laughs> it's a little tiny town on the Illinois-Indiana border. And this Sears house from 1913 is there in pristine condition, every detail original. It was such a treasure. And then nearby Louisville, Illinois is right near Flora. And I was doing a lecture series there. And one of my hosts 
said, let me show you this house in Louisville because um, somebody said it was a Sears house, but we just don't know. And so she took me there and I looked at this house and I said, oh, no, it's not a Sears house. It's from the Harris Brothers. It's a model 5010. I was showing off. I had got this catalog page three days earlier. <laughs> 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 and so that was my fun for the day. A Sterling model Vernon. This is in Batavia, Illinois, right on Route 31. And for years, up and down the Fox River Valley, people would say to me, oh, have you found the big old Sears house? It's on Route 31 in Batavia. And I drive up and down Route 31 yet one more time, and I'd look for it, could find it. And one day, my colleague from Michigan, Dale Woolicky, was with me, and we drove down Route 31 through Batavia. And he says, oh, there's the Sterling Vernon model. <laughs> that is the big house that everybody said was from Sears. So we got that one straightened out. This is, was a very popular Aladdin model. People think that mail order houses were necessarily small, but um, it's not true. You've just seen three nice big ones. That was a very popular model, kind of an Italian Renaissance style. And this is a Harris Brothers house. In their 1911 catalog, they, they claim that this was their most popular model. And I believe it, I have seen it everywhere. And I'm entirely grateful to them for this little piece of design here. You don't see that every day. <laughs> so when I see a little turret like that, I, I pay attention right away. The, so Frank Lloyd Wright came along and prairie style architecture became popular in certain circles anyway. And only two of the mail order house companies jumped on the bandwagon to produce mail order houses, actually three. Um, Sears had two models, Gordon Van Tyne had one and Harris Brothers had eight. And those prairie style models stayed in the catalogs for only a year or two, which tells us what? Not popular. People were not ready for prairie style mail order houses and so they disappeared from the catalogs. This is the largest and most expensive home that Sears ever produced. It's a kind of a Southern plantation style and they named it the Magnolia, of course. <laughs> we only know of seven of these nationwide. Um, one of them we only know of from old pictures because it burned. Um, so that's a very rare find. Oh, remember 1920? Remember before 1920, everyone's out in the country. So, makes sense, right? If you're producing mail order houses, maybe you better do some barns. There's a big market out there. So, Sears and Gordon Van Tyne were the major suppliers of mail order farm buildings. And um, Aladdin, Wards, and Harris Brothers put a few in their catalogs just to be good sports. But Gordon Van Tyne and Sears were the major competitors. This is an arts and crafts style dairy barn from Sears. And I will tell you of all the mail order barns, this is the only one I can identify from the street. Look at this detail. You've got five part knee braces. You've got um, little barge boards, you've got uh, exposed rafter tails, all this architectural detail. Most barns aren't so fancy. So I'm very happy about Sears. This barn used to be out in the country up in Michigan, it was a dairy barn. And gradually the town grew out until the town had surrounded the farm. And um, there was a guy in town who loved this barn so much and he couldn't stand the thought that it might be torn down. So he bought it and he completely restored it and he bought the land around it and he put up 11 mid-century modern little ranches around it. And uh, it's always on the barn tours in Michigan. So you could also get your poultry house. You could get pig sheds. You could get, you know, granaries, any kind of farm building. 
And then World War I came along and it made a lot of changes in the housing market because after the war, there's a lot of veterans and they want a place to live. Yeah, that they deserve it. They want a place to live. But there was a shortage of money and materials. And so instead of the larger houses that were out on the farm, they started making smaller houses. And these are some of them. This was the era of the bungalow, the Sears Roebuck sunlight model and Gordon Van Tyne model in Iowa, the Harris Brothers model, Franklin Park, that's right around the Chicago area. And by the way, yes, that is original. And I thank Harris Brothers every time I see it because it's one of those um, unmistakable details. So a Gordon Van Tyne model and a one from Harris Brothers. A Sears Josephine model and a Lewis model and a lovely Aladdin sunshine model. I love the names. I can just, it's like names of paint colors today. You can just see everybody sitting in the board meeting going, okay, what are we going to call this green color here? They, or they're saying, what are we going to name this house? And um, they thought of all these names. So by the end of the 20s, the economy had recovered and um, people were building a little larger and fancier kinds of houses. In fact, the highest sales of mail order houses was 1928 and 1929. And a Sterling company in their catalog predicted that in 10 years, 80% of the houses in the country would be mail order houses. And we know what happened next, right? 1929, November, and the Great Depression. That uh, made a huge difference. Well, these are some of the 1920s models, okay? Interestingly, Bay City, Michigan, Aladdin Company built actual models of their popular catalog homes, and buyers would come to their office and they could take them on a tour through town there's a thousand mail order homes in Bay City, Michigan. So the buyer could drive up and down the street and see what they really wanted. And this is the original Pomona. There's Alhambra. The end of the 20s, right, is the everything revival area era. You've got colonial revival, Dutch colonial revival, Tudor revival. You've got mission revival. You've got Spanish revival. Um, everybody's hearkening back to the old days and putting architectural elements from those styles on their houses. See this? Norwood Park, Illinois. See that? Yep. <laughs> the Sears Martha Washington, a Dutch colonial revival. The mail order house business boomed so much that um, major companies opened up local sales offices. Um, Elgin, Illinois had one, and Sears built actual sales models that were in the salesman's office. So the buyer would come in, you can take the roof off, you can see the room layout, the closets, every little detail. And so they would have these models in their office to show people. This one is a uh, remnant from the Sears Roebuck archives when they closed the building recently, they dispensed with everything from the archives. I would have liked to see them donate it to uh, Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library in Springfield, for example, who would have been glad to take it, but no, but no. So this was salvaged. It is for sale if anybody wants a Puritan model. <laughs> Spanish Revival. This is one of my favorite mail order houses. I wouldn't mind having it. Tudor Revival, that's in Elmhurst. <laughs> it's, um, this one, this bottle was not a popular one and I think this is the only one that uh, we have come across so far. So the Great Depression, housing starts are down 52%. Nobody has any money. Everybody is moving in with their relatives. 
Um, they are making the sunroom into a couple of bedrooms and their aunt and uncle live there. Um, it was really bad for Sears and their mortgage financing because um, Sears lost over $8 million by 1932 in uncollectible mortgages. They had to open up a whole new division in their headquarters to buy and sell real estate, which was nothing they ever had in mind. But they repossessed all these houses and then they had to sell them. It was very sad. Uh, Montgomery Ward had only started offering financing in 1928, so they didn't lose a lot of money. And uh, Ward saw the writing on the wall and they got out in 1931 and so did Harris Brothers. Um, it changed the architectural detailing because by this time, hardwood forests had been depleted Everybody just assumed in this country that we could cut down all the trees we want and we'd never run out of lumber. And no one in the early years thought to replant anything. So um, hardwood is very expensive now and we don't have a lot of money. And so new building materials came about. They started using steel beams for support instead of wood. And they started using plywood, which was much cheaper than other lumber. And they also took away all of the architectural details. So the homes became very basic. Um, we have no porches, no overhanging eaves, no architectural detail. And of course, prosperity returns again. And the companies modernized their designs to make them more contemporary. And um, this is a split level from Sears. Sears had like five split level houses in their catalog. And they're, uh, they weren't very popular, but um, they are around. So if you, you can find a mail order split level. This is a little Gordon Van Tyne 1930s home in Mendota. And here's one, Western Springs. As I said, they're all over the place, right? Right. This is still colonial revival, um, but it's much simplified. And this is an oddity from Sears. This harkens back to the early 1870s, uh, 1865 to 75, about um, this mansard roof was very popular then. And Sears brought this one model back and it was in their catalogs for a couple of years. This is the only one that, that any of us have ever seen in the whole country. So a treasure, not popular, but a good treasure. So World War II came along and the um, government put a kibosh on any new house construction. And... Um, this was a big challenge to the mail order house companies that were still in business, which was mainly uh, Lewis and Sterling and Aladdin. And they made it through the war by building army barracks and making pallets and things like that because they couldn't construct any new houses. And, um, you know, Sears closed their modern homes division in 1940 and Gordon Van Tyne staggered along through the war, but then in 1946, they sold the facilities to a buyer who just split up all the assets and that was it for Gordon Van Tyne. After World War II, housing changed in a major way in this country. Instead of a family buying a lot and putting up a single house for themselves, Developers bought up huge tracts of property and divided it into lots and had architects draw up a bunch of designs. They were mostly this tract housing, they called it. It was mostly the same floor plan with slightly different exteriors. And so if you wanted to buy a lot in the new development, you had to pick one of their designs. And so that made it very hard for mail order companies to compete. And um, you know, Western ranch designs started coming in. 
And then Sears decided to see if they could somehow squeeze back into the housing market. And so in the late 1940s, they developed their sectional homes. They had about 11 different models. The, the first catalog was 49 and the last one was 51, as far as we can tell. And um, they were cheaply made and cheap to buy and um, architecturally not too interesting. <laughs> and um, But they sold a few and then they stop doing that too. Prefabrication comes along big time. I know we had that house from Lestron Company, Columbus, Ohio. They bought an airplane factory and converted it to make all steel homes because they believed that steel is the building material of the future. And so these houses, in, inside to outside, it's all steel. The roof is steel. The walls inside are steel. Uh, the kitchen cabinets, everything. Uh, and they went bankrupt in three years, having produced just under 3,000 houses. So I guess we weren't ready for the all steel home. But um, if you're interested in these, Thomas Fetters has written a book called The Lestron Home which is one of the best research books I've ever seen. I don't know if the library has it. It might be something you uh, want to take a look at, but it's a fascinating story. It goes from day one all the way through to the end. Um, Prefabricated housing companies um, put a big dent in the mail order house market because their, their stick was they will bring the house to your building lot and put it up for you. How do you like that? They're all sectional homes, both together on site. And um, many people would much rather have somebody bring the stuff to their door and put it up. And so prefabricated housing became the main type of construction in those years. The only company I pay much attention to is Gunnison Homes. See that chimney? You don't see that every day. Uh-oh, where's my chimney? I lost my chimney. There it is. So that that chimney tells me it's a Gunnison home. And again, they're all over the place. A mail, a prefabricated housing company would deliver within a radius of about 300 miles from their plant. And so you have many, 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 many plants making prefabricated housing all over the country. And the reference I recently saw online where they said millions of Sears houses sprang up all over the country. I, this, they're talking about this, not Sears. <laughs> all, I think of all the main mail order house companies I've mentioned tonight, the total production of all of them combined from all the years they were in business is, is less than a quarter million. <laughs> oh, um, I thought that reference online was kind of mistaken. Ah, some ranches, the Aladdin Alamo, radiantly modern. I love that. I love that. <laughs> um, it's harder for me to identify the ranch homes from the street because starting with the Cape Cods, that's where I start having difficulty with my visual identification because they all look alike. You know, there's less architectural detail, less variation from model to model. Um, so a lot of these, I find them from the sales records from Aladdin Company or word of mouth or historical societies. Hear about them and tell me. There's a Ventura, there's a Brentwood. So again, they're just copying the popular styles of the day. Um, the ranch houses started to be popular when the automobile became popular because um, commuters were no longer restricted by computer, commuter lines, uh, trains, buses. They could drive out there and have a big piece of land with a sprawling house and drive themselves to work. So that went on for a while. And then of course, land became more scarce and they started building ranches in a two-story format. So here is a two-story ranch house. 
How do we find them? Well, we get the crazy crew together and we come to your town and drive around. <laughs> My friend Dale at work, they were, everybody was going to go on this cruise and because they all had the same vacation. And they said, Dale, come on the cruise. And Dale says, I would be so bored on the cruise. And they said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to drive around and look for mail order houses. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the popular press I find articles in newspapers company records would be a really great thing except the only one we have is Aladdin um, but look at mortgage that's a, a little legal document you know you know what gets recorded at the county recorder of deeds you know what <laughs> and, if once we crack the code of how to identify a Sears mortgage, um, when I go to a new town, I stop at the recorder of deeds and I um, look up all the possible mortgages. I was just in Indiana doing that a couple months ago. It turns out the mortgage financing was done in the name of trustees, not in the name of Sears or Wards. So once we got the trustee names, then you go through the grantor-grantee records and you look under grantees and you look for these names. And we found a number of houses. And I love the mortgage record search because the houses I find visually are the ones that look like the picture in the book, right? Right, because that's all I have, the picture in the book, right? Um, the mail order house companies were glad to make modifications for your house. Um, the uh, the Hazelton model that's here in Norwood Park has some original alter alterations that the original buyer wanted. Some windows are changed. The location of the steps to the porch is changed. Um, the attic was finished, things like that. And so when the house has changed so much, it doesn't look like the picture in the book. If I find a mortgage record, that is kind of a nice way to clean up my research for a given town because the mortgage record is there whether the house looks like itself or not. Of course, you find weird things like I found an 1890s house that had a Sears mortgage. Now, the mortgage was just for a little addition they put on the front. It wasn't for the whole house. I also found a Sears mortgage. Um, they bought a furnace from Sears and mortgaged the house in order to buy the furnace. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Blueprints are rare. I have a small collection that I've gathered from across the country. Uh, the first blueprint I saw was found in the attic of a Sears Valonia model, and it was in a squirrel's nest. <laughs> little bits of paper. Um, correspondence is very fun if anybody has saved it. My favorite is a letter from Sears to a house buyer saying, um, we know that you've built your house and we asked you to send us a photograph of the finished house. We have yet to receive this. If you perhaps don't have a camera, perhaps you could borrow one from a neighbor and send it to us. <laughs> the blueprints, there's a good blueprint story. One of the houses in Elgin, a neighbor was walking his dog and the Sears house in front of him, they were moving out and everything was in the trash. And he saw this set of blueprints in the neighbor's trash. And so he pulled it out. <laughs> it was the blueprints for the Sears house. And so the house sold and the man didn't like the new owner. And so he kept the blueprint until the house sold again 10 years later. And then he knocked on the door and said, um, I have the blueprints to your house if you'd like. <laughs> so fun. So part numbers. This is um, a very nice thing <coughs> and a good way to find them. And I've got... I don't know, I could pass some of these around perhaps. We have numbers that are written by hand and stamped in ink. We have, you can pass that around. We have shipping, shipping labels either in ink 
or paper here. I'll start one around this side. We have um, part names on the sides of boards. And um, that, if, if you find part numbers, you have a mail order house. And so that's my favorite thing is to um, track down the numbers if possible. They are on the framing boards. You won't find them on trim boards, doors, windows, things like that. They're on the basic skeleton of the house. And I always look first in the basement. I look at the joists and I go behind the basement stairs and look at the treads and risers and stringers because those are the easiest to see. And if that doesn't work, then I go in the attic, but it's fun. So my visual search goes like this. I start with a catalog picture and I identify uh, like field marks, I call them, like bird watching, you know, it's got a yellow beak and purple feet, okay? So I have field marks for this house and they are a triangular entry with an arch under it and a little triangle above it. Nice, huh? Got, um, whoops, back, back. We got round porch columns, okay? We've got this triple window with two small windows and a big one and then small panes up here. Um, we've got, oh, we got lovely side lights by the door here. And so um, I have found a couple of houses that have the original trellises, but that's really too much to hope for. So I don't count those as my field marks. And so I have those things in my brain and I start driving around and I go, yeah, look, 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 look. We've got the porch columns, we got the round arch, we got the triangle, we got the windows, we got the side lights. Yes, I'll put it on the list. <laughs> and then I go, oh no, what happened here? It's all brick. That could be, that could be. When you look at a mail order house catalog, it's easy to imagine that the house has to have the same cladding as the picture in the catalog. It is not true the buyer could choose the exterior cladding, brick, stucco, clapboard, or shingle. And so any model you see in any of those catalogs, it could be with a different exterior cladding. So yes, it is a Sears Crescent and it's, and it's a brick crescent and it's got your round columns and your arch and your triangle and your side lights and your windows. Yes, we'll take it. Oh, this one, what, something happened here. They closed in the porch, but did it stop me? No, it didn't. <laughs> it did not. I could see through the screen that we have the side lights by the door. We got the round column. I guess there might have been a arch with a triangle, but they covered it up. Eh, can't do anything about that. But we got the windows. We got the columns, got the side lights. We got the basic size and shape. I'll put it on the list. Okay. <laughs> I drove right by this one the first time. I stopped about four houses down the block and I said, what was that? And I drove around the block and I parked in front of it. <laughs> and I went side lights, a round arch, round columns, a triple window. And it's got a second floor. And somebody built a second story that's in keeping with the original architecture. Thank you very much. I heartily endorse that. You need more room, make a colonial house that looks like a colonial house, has my blessing. Just go for it. This is a, a something else. <laughs> <laughs> the owners of this house quadrupled the square footage. Okay. They built this dormer. First, they put this dormer. And then they raised, oops, back again, they raised the whole roof. And there's a huge extension off the back. And you know, it was sweet of them. They kept the foyer with the little triangle and the round columns and the side lights and the windows. And um, there you go. It's amazing what an architect can do for you, isn't it? How are we doing on time? I see, okay, we're doing good. So proof, I look for part numbers, blueprints, mortgage records, we talked all about that. Um, testimonials, my book, Putting Sears Homes on the Map is a database, really. 
I compiled all the testimonials printed in the Sears Modern Homes catalogs. Mostly it tells us model city and state, very few addresses, but it's good guideline. You know, if we're going to some part of the country, you can look up in there and um, see if there's any specific model you could be looking for. So we talked about part numbers. My favorite thing about the part numbers is the different companies use different formats. Thank you. So if I get a number, not only do I know it's a mail order house, but I got a pretty good clue where it came from. And so those are some of the things that are being passed around the room. Blueprints, as I said, very rare. Ah, you're about to build one of Sears Roebuck Company's houses. It's important to protect yourself to heed the following. Make certain first that the lot on which you will build is the same lot described in your deed. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, make sure that the house is within the lot line. Good advice. Good advice. <laughs> uh, testimonials. This is a Gordon Van Tine barn in the catalog. Manhattan, Illinois. I went to the library in Manhattan and I held up the picture and I said, anybody know where this is? And I said, oh yeah, that's out on Cedar Road. <laughs> That's a very unusual thing around barn. You don't see that every day. So that one was easy. So yeah, I if I hear a story about a house that came on the train, I start asking questions because that doesn't happen every day. And so that's a good clue. Um, yep. So shipping labels can be paper or printed in ink. I'm just kind of rushing through this because I want to leave a little time for questions. So um, historic preservation. Are we going to save mail order homes? Are we going to put them on the National Register? Hey, what's going on with that? Um, my personal take on it is the mail order house phenomenon as it grew up in this country is pretty unique worldwide. And so I think we need to pay attention to it and we need to acknowledge the houses and save, not all, but save a goodly number. We need to do surveys and make lists. If one is gonna be torn down, we need to do photo and video documentation before we rip it apart um, to save the history. And that's my personal take on it. Um, yep. So, there's a lot of work to be done, and I'm very willing to train new researchers. Shoot me an email, <laughs> okay? Anybody have any questions? Yeah. What kind of instruction did the homeowner get? Oh, the homeowner got a whole booklet, about an 80-page booklet. Better than idea? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yes, yes, they're better than Ikea. Yeah. It's better Did the uh, houses come with uh, plumbing fixtures and um, um, sinks and things like that also? No, you could, if the mail order house company offered such items in their catalog, you could order them as extras, heating, plumbing, electric, but that was not included in the basic house. You got um, the house, the roofing shingles, the paint, the varnish, uh, the windows, the doors, but if you wanted storms and screens, you had to pay extra for that. If you wanted built-in cabinetry, you had to pay extra for that. And as I said, if like Sears and Wards had all of the uh, utility fixtures, and so you could order that as extras, but it was not included. Here, yeah. here, back here. Oh, you got the mic back there. Were the homes in Levittown, Pennsylvania, tract homes, or were any of those mail order? Those are tract homes. I think I can, I can speak for you, right? Well, we need no, it for the Zoom. We need it for the Zoom. Have you... 
Is this working? Yeah. Okay. It's not a yes. PA, Mike. It's hmm? not a PA, Mike. Oh, you got the. I'm sorry. Okay. You're talking for the people on Zoom. Oh, but oh I'm talking for the people on Zoom. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize we were Zooming. Yeah. We're Zooming. Yeah. Have you ever seen the Buster Keaton film where he and his wife build a home from the kit and the <laughs> bad guy mixes up the instructions? <laughs> and it's, yes. It's, yes. Oh, okay. Just wondering. Good joke. Check it out. It is hilarious. <laughs> Here we go. Anybody on Zoom will need to unmute themselves to ask a question. And I'm making sure we, we're not competing. Uh, a few notes in your pictures mentioned lack of basements. What was the thinking on uh, basements? The basement is dependent on geographic things. If you build a house in this area, you have a basement. If you build a house in San Diego, you don't have a basement. If you build a house in Alabama, you don't have a basement. <laughs> it depends on uh, what the local um, thing is. You could a mail order house could have a basement or not. A but lot it, of it would the, be all the uh, a lot the of the prefabricated tract homes do not have basements, no matter where they are. But the mail order houses, yes. But it would be at the expense of the uh, purchaser right. of the house. The, um, Things that were not included with your purchase price. So the price on the catalog is approximately half of your whole cost. You have to buy the lot, you have to put in the foundation, and you have to provide the labor. Here we go. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, are there any uh, mail or houses with a solar collector or wind generator on the roof? Oh, I'm sure somebody has put them on by now. <laughs> At the time they were built, no. Was insulation included? And do current homes uh, have that problem of e energy efficiency? Um, insulation was not included. Um, actually, it... I'm not sure when fiberglass insulation came in, um, but there was a whole, asbestos was a good insulating material and um, there were a number of lawsuits against Sears because of asbestos in the mail order houses. And that caused Sears to lock up their archives and ship all the materials into storage <laughs> because Sears didn't want to know if they ever sold a mail order house to these people. None of the lawsuits stood up because every builder used asbestos. You can't blame Sears for using a building material that was standard. You know, yeah. Those homes that you said had brick, that was just brick veneer. Not a yeah, it's face brick. Okay. Yeah, it's brick veneer. What? What was the incentive for purchasing one of these mail order houses when basically it was coming a la carte? So you could get the shell and then you could do all the interior work yourself if you were handy. Um, you could put the whole house together if you were handy. And you didn't just get a shell. You got the rooms, the doors, the windows, the closet. Um, what was the incentive? Why would someone choose? Money. You saved a third of the cost over traditional construction by ordering pre-cut parts. You don't have to pay a carpenter to measure and cut every board. And you don't have an annoying pile of lumber left over that you paid for. <laughs> also, because of mass production and um, bulk sales, the mail order companies could offer lower prices on shingles, paint, varnish, lumber, everything like that because um, they produce so much of it. Did you tell us how much those houses range from? I did prices? not because the prices go all the way from $149 up to uh, 10,000. <laughs> you know? But you Depends. started $149. Uh, well, that's the early Aladdin company little shack, okay up to the Sears 10 room models, the Aladdin Villa, um, 
it depended on how big it was. Um, so the prices were, that's a huge spectrum. Yeah, what's the modern equivalent of a ma mail order house? There really isn't one. I suppose you could call modular construction the closest thing that we have to it now. So they build a whole room and lower it in place with a crane. And you have a bunch of different room things and you can have them put in any order you want. And they just lower it, chunk, chunk, chunk into place. Should we call it quits? I know we have to be out of here in eight minutes. Yes. So. No, we um, 7.34. We don't have to be out in eight minutes. 10 minutes. Um, oh, we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes. We have 10, 10 minutes. minutes. But <laughs> just so everyone knows, if you're interested, um, Dr. Hunter's books are for sale. They're right over there. Sharon, are you going to handle the sales? No. You can't do that. You see me if you wish to buy If a you book. wish to buy a book, see Dr. Hunter. They're right there. And then there's all this. And we thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you.